Michael Burry, the investor who became famous by betting against the U.S. housing market before it crashed, is at it again. In a one-word tweet in January, Burry made it clear where he thinks stock markets are headed. He tweeted simply, sell. Burry, who was made famous in the movie The Big Short, is calling for a stock market crash. And if Michael Burry thinks the markets are headed for a crash, we should probably listen, because Burry has an uncanny track record of getting it right when everyone else is getting it wrong. But since his sell tweet in January, things have gone the other way. In fact, the S&P 500 is up around 15% since its lows last October. So has Burry finally gotten it wrong? Has his streak finally been broken? Not necessarily. There is plenty of evidence to indicate the stock market correction that began last year still has a ways to go. As has happened many times before in market corrections, we may be in a short-term upswing in the middle of a long-term downswing. So why should we listen to Michael Burry? What is he saying now that his January sell tweet turned out to be bad advice? And what's in store for the market? We'll discuss all these questions in this video, but first, make sure to subscribe to our channel for the latest news and analysis on the state of the economy. And if you like this video, hit the like button to help us spread the word. Michael Burry became famous during the great financial crisis of 2008 when he and his hedge fund made money hand over fist during a time when almost everyone was losing money. How did he do it? By correctly predicting the housing market crash and betting on it happening. Back in the mid-2000s, Burry started looking at the financial statements of banks and realized that they were making bad loans, specifically bad mortgages. At that time, mortgage lending was exploding and it was incredibly irresponsible. Lenders invented ninja loans, mortgages given to people with no income, no job, and no assets. There were negative amortization loans, where borrowers not only didn't have to pay back the principal, they could even skip paying the interest part of their loan. All the interest owed simply got tacked on to the amount owing, causing the mortgage to get larger and larger over time. But the mortgage innovation that really got Burry's attention was the Adjustable Rate Mortgage, or ARM. These were mortgages that offered borrowers a very low interest rate, well below market rates, for the first five years. Then after the initial low interest period, the interest rate skyrocketed. To make up for five years of losses, lenders would charge above market interest rates on the loan from the rest of its term. Burry realized that many of the people taking out ARMs wouldn't be able to afford them once the interest rate soared after the five-year introductory period. Many households would become insolvent. Many would have to sell their homes. The housing market was headed for a bust. The first three of these ARMs were issued in 2002, so Burry made a prediction. The housing market would start collapsing in 2007 when the first of these loans saw their interest rate spike and he saw an opportunity to make money on the crash. Mortgage lenders were bundling these bad mortgages together with good mortgages and selling them to investors as mortgage-backed securities. So Burry bet against these mortgage-backed securities through derivatives known as credit default swaps. In simplest terms, Burry shorted the mortgage market. And he was right. By the end of the housing market crash, Burry had personally made $100 million from credit default swaps, and his hedge fund made $700 million for its investors. He did it by seeing what no one else saw, or maybe what no one else wanted to see. So is he doing it again? Does Burry see something no one else sees? At the end of March, two months after his sell tweet turned out to be bad advice, Burry posted a chart to Twitter with the caption, going back to the 1920s. There has been no BTFD generation like you. Congratulations. Burry's tweet is sarcastic. Essentially, he's saying there is irrational enthusiasm in the stock markets right now. Let's break down what this tweet is saying. BTFD stands for buy the effing dip, and it's an investor philosophy. It basically says that when the stock market has a down day, it's a good time to buy because you can pick up stocks at a discount. The chart in Burry's tweet shows the S&P 500's average return following a down day in the market. It shows that from the 1940s through the 1980s, the S&P's returns were negative after a down day. In other words, investors reacted with pessimism when the market had a bad day and sold off their holdings. But over the past few decades, the buy the effing dip attitude has taken hold. And over the past 20 years, down days on the market have usually been followed by up days as investors jump on the cheaper stocks. 
But what's really interesting is the past several years, which have seen stronger up days following a down day than ever before. This is what Burry means by no BTFD generation like you. The demand for stocks following a down day is stronger than it has ever been before, but far from suggesting the market is in good shape, what Burry is saying is that the market is more irrational than it has ever been. So even though Burry was wrong to advise people to sell in January, he's saying that the stock market crash is still ahead of us. Is he right this time? No one can say for sure, but there is plenty of evidence to suggest the stock market correction that began last year and reversed itself in recent months still has a ways to go. One good measure of whether a stock market is undervalued or overvalued is the price-earnings ratio. This is a measure that compares a company's stock price to its earnings. The higher the P-E ratio, the more overvalued a stock is, and therefore, presumably, the more vulnerable it is to a correction. The lower the P-E ratio, the more undervalued a stock is. That is, there is a good chance the stock will go up in price as investors realized it's underpriced. We can look at the P-E ratio for entire stock markets as well, but looking at the raw P-E ratio might not actually give you a good idea of stock values. That's because stock markets have upswings and downswings from day to day, and businesses can have bad earnings quarters or good earnings quarters that don't tell you much about their long-term health. So Yale University economist Robert Schiller created the Cyclically Adjusted Price-Earnings Ratio, or CAPE Ratio. This compares a company's stock price to its inflation-adjusted earnings over 10 years. That gives you a much more stable measure of a company's true value. We look at the S&P 500 today, we see it has a very high CAPE Ratio compared to its historical long run. As of mid-April, the CAPE Ratio for the S&P 500 was around 29.6. Historically, the average is around 17. What this means is that the S&P 500 stocks are 75% overvalued compared to their historic norms. To get back to their historic norms, stock prices would have to fall by more than 40%. And looking at the chart of the CAPE ratio over time, it's clear stocks have never managed to stay at valuation levels this high for very long. In fact, it's only happened twice before briefly during the dot-com bubble of 2000, and again briefly during the post-pandemic market bull run a couple years ago. There has been so much BTFD in recent years that stock prices have reached ridiculous levels. For most of history, stock market valuations have been below these levels. By this measure alone, stocks have lots of downside and not much upside. But many market players today have an argument against this. They say that there is money on the sidelines waiting to jump into the market whenever stocks go down. You may have heard the expression, money on the sidelines. Essentially, the argument is that when stocks go down, investors take their cash savings and put it into stocks. Unfortunately, there are two big problems with the money on the sidelines argument. The first is that right now, the amount of money in the economy is actually shrinking. There's less and less cash out there available to be put into the market. The second is that money on the sidelines is usually money pulled out of the stock market in the first place, and the reality is that it mostly doesn't get put back into the stock market. Let's break this all down. The M2 money supply is the measure of how much money there is in the economy. It measures physical cash, deposits in banks, and money market funds. And right now, the M2 money supply is shrinking for the first time since the Great Depression more than 80 years ago. This is largely the doing of the Federal Reserve. During the pandemic when economic panic was breaking out, the Fed injected hundreds of billions of dollars of new cash into the economy. It didn't do this directly, rather it bought government bonds from the market using newly created money. So bondholders ended up with the new cash, and the Fed ended up with a giant portfolio of mostly government bonds. The policy was called quantitative easing. Now, inflation is raging and the Fed is struggling to bring it under control. To get inflation down, the Fed has reversed course and is now pursuing the opposite policy, known as quantitative tightening. In other words, it's making the money supply shrink. Once again, it's not doing this directly, but through the bond markets. To keep the total supply of money stable, the Fed would have to keep buying new bonds once the bonds on its books reached maturity. But under quantitative tightening, it isn't doing that. Instead, when a bond matures, the Fed writes it off its books. 
In other words, it's as if the money used to pay off that bond has disappeared. In February of this year, the M2 money supply was 2.24% smaller than it was a year earlier. This is the first year-over-year -year decline in the money supply since the Great Depression. To be sure, the money shrinkage during the Great Depression was far worse than what we're seeing right now. Between 1929 and 1933, the money supply declined by 28%. By comparison, our current decline is a drop in the bucket. Nonetheless, we are in uncharted territory. No investor alive today has been through an era in which money has been disappearing, and the idea that there will always be more money to pour into the stock market looks increasingly like a fantasy. In fact, the whole money on the sidelines argument may have been a fantasy to begin with. In a recent analysis, Lance Roberts, the chief strategist and economist at RIA Advisors, looked at the history of money market funds to see how cash flows in and out of stock markets. Roberts used money market funds as a proxy for overall cash savings. What he found was that when the economy turns bad, investors pull money out of stocks and put it into cash savings. That much was known, and it's not much of a surprise. But what Roberts found was that when the economy recovers, investors only put a very small fraction of cash savings back into stocks. Most of the money stayed as cash savings. In fact, these money market funds have been accumulating cash since 1974, regardless of whether stock markets have been strong or weak. In other words, the money on the sidelines argument is a myth but it's a convenient one that has helped prop up the stock market for a long time. But now with a recession looking likely, even by the Fed's own admission, the money on the sidelines myth may not last much longer. Burry's tweet urging people to sell may not have been wrong. It may have only been premature. Given overvalued stock prices, irrational enthusiasm in the market, and a shrinking money supply, our stock market problems may have only just begun. If you like this video, please click the like button to help us spread the word. And if you like our content and want to see more, click on one of these videos to learn about the economic debacles unfolding around the world. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for notifications on the latest content. Thanks for watching.